Amen. John chapter 9, verses 6 through 25. And I read today from the King James text, and I'll put it on the screen overhead so those here with us can read it. Uh, yeah, I will. All right, let me see. There we go. If you do not have a Bible, or if it's easier for you to do so, you can read it on the screen behind me. John chapter 9, verses 6 through 25. And the King James text today reads, When he, meaning Jesus, had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam which is, by interpretation, sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and baked? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, whom ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Verse 22, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Final verse, verse 25. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, I can only tell you this. Hallelujah. If you bow your heads with me a moment, 
King Jesus, lover of men's souls, we love you today, God, and we are grateful for the bread of life, the word of God. We are grateful for the inspiration, the hope, the joy that it's able to stir within our bosom as the word of God goes forth in power and victory. Lord, I am the lowliest of your creation, and I humble myself before you, God. For, Lord, I understand all too readily that I have no gifts or abilities that can help anyone, but I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need a touch from God. I need you, Lord, to work in me and through me that I might preach the Word of God with boldness and yet preach it in love so that the hearer might receive healing and restoration. They might receive that word of truth that brings salvation. They might receive God today the, in response to their faith, deliverance and healing and blessing. Master, in the name of Jesus, work through me this hour. Speak through me this hour. Allow me to be a blessing and a help to the people of God. This is my desire above all else. And allow every ear of this moment that is listening to be touched by heaven. Allow us, O oh God, to have a fertile ground upon which the seed of your word might fall, that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness and true holiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God and amen. Oh. I love this story that we read about in John chapter 9. Jesus heals a man who is born blind. And the reaction of the religious is far from positive. Can you imagine? Doesn't it seem absurd? Doesn't it seem that there would only be cause for rejoicing? There would only be cause for positive re reactions and positive responses to a man being healed from who had lived his entire life from birth blind, completely unable to see. But you know, religion has a way of perverting and twisting and ruining everything. Mm -hmm. I mean to tell you, religion can take the blessing of God and the goodness of God and try to twist it and turn it and make it into a curse. Hello now. Yes, it can. I want to tell you today, my friend, there is no sense this hour debating theology with someone who is religious. I'll tell you, religious people are going to believe what religious people believe. And you're not going to convince them because their loyalty and their commitment is not to the Word of God. Their loyalty and their commitment is to their religion. Mm -hmm. And whatever their religion teaches, that is what they're going to uphold. It doesn't matter if you can show them plain as day that the Word of God says something different. They're going to choose their traditions. They're going to choose their organizational doctrines, dogmas, teachings, even over the clear statement of the Word of God. That's what religion does. Religion turns the Word of God into a legal document rather than a love letter from heaven. What a sad thing. When I look back at my life and my ministry, I realize that many, many years I spent reading the Word of God from that perspective. There were many, many years I spent reading the Word of God as a legal document, never understanding, oh, you know, we would hear it spoken of as a love letter from the Lord. But somehow or another, uh, it was called a love letter, but it was not read as a love letter. Mm -hmm. It was read as a legal document full of do's and don'ts and rules and regulations, dogmas and doctrines. All of which were essential to salvation, because after all, it's holiness or hell. Mm -hmm. At least that's the tradition I came up in. Well, I've got news for you today. 
as this blind man ultimately said to the religious leaders who were questioning him following his miracle, the proof is in the pudding. It is not in your theology. It is not in your religious organization. It is not in your religious dogma and doctrine. But the proof is in the pudding. Even the word of God tells us wisdom is justified of her children. In other words, wisdom is proven to be wisdom by the results that that wisdom brings. You may not see it as wisdom. There's a lot of people out there I was talking a little while ago about approaching things from a certain perspective to help a major apostolic denomination uh, be able to use our teaching and, you know, uh, and not create problems within that denomination. And I know people, I've been, I've been in ministry an awful long time. And I'm sure there were some, Tommy, who were sitting there saying, well, bless God, you should have just left it all together because that way they could be exposed to your teaching on LGBT issues and stuff too. Well, the only problem with that is they'll read what they read in the LGBT and then they will discount every word I say otherwise and they won't even bother to look at what I say in the doctrinal and in the other areas. Sure will. But you know, it works the same way in reverse. They'll read what I write in the doctrinal, they'll read what I write in the theological realm, and then guess what? They want to find out more about our church. They want to find out more about our ministry, and they wind up looking for us elsewhere, and then they do learn about other aspects of this ministry. But at least I have done things in such a way, trying to utilize wisdom so that I don't moon somebody I want to make my friend. Hello now. Right. You want to make friends with somebody, it isn't smart to immediately uh, moon them, if I might use that example, okay? Uh, we got too many people in the LGBT community who think that the wisest way to go about building bridges and building a conversation and building understanding is to be in people's face. And they offend and then they're like, well, that's God, you just need to be offended because you need to get used to it. Well, uh, you know, that argumentative and combative mindset, you may think that that's the brightest way you can go about things. I've got news for you. It is not wisdom and it doesn't work. Right. This ministry has the support and the Respect of, I don't even know how many non-LGBT preachers and ministers. We have found out over the years that some of the biggest names in Christendom today follow our ministry on YouTube. I don't share their names. Why do I do that? Because I'm trying to be aloof? You know, I'm trying to play a game? No, no, no. Because I don't want them getting in any trouble while they're trying to learn from us and see what we're teaching and see what we have to say. I don't want to rock the boat. I want them to be able to continue to look into this ministry and find out what we're all about. I've had people write me and say, how in the world can you have the anointing of the Holy Ghost on your ministry and on your preaching that you've got and not be telling the truth? I said, you must be telling the truth. You must be telling it right. Why? Because the proof is in the pudding. Hello now. Mm -hmm. This blind man, blind from birth, ran into Jesus. Oh, I'm going to tell you the best, uh, <laughs> the best confrontation I ever had was the day that I ran face to face into Jesus. I lived in New York City for 10 years, and while I lived in New York City, there was one day that I was in a bit of a hurry. I don't remember where I was going, but I was kind of rushing down West 4th Street, headed toward Christopher Street, and uh, uh, I think it's 7th Avenue or Avenue of the Americas, whatever it was. And I'm rushing down the street and not really paying a lot of attention to what I'm doing. And all of a sudden I accidentally bumped into a man. 
who was wearing sunglasses, you know, and he fell to the ground and his sunglasses fell off and he reached for a sunglass and I reached down to help him up and I kind of helped him up. And as I did, he's putting his glasses back on and I'm looking at him and I said, gee, he looks awful familiar to me. That guy looks so familiar to me. And for the life of me, I could not picture who, who he was. Anybody who knows me knows that names and I don't get along well. It takes me a while to remember a name. Well, he began very quickly. It, it was funny. He acted very nervous, you know, almost like I knocked him down on purpose, you know, and I certainly didn't. And he went and he began to quickly walk, you know, past me and to continue on his way. Maybe he was in a hurry like I was to get where he was going. But as he rushed off, it, it dawned on me, suddenly a light came on. And I said, oh my goodness, that was Matthew Broderick, the star of stage and film, you know. And I said, oh my goodness, that was Matthew Broderick. That was the man who starred in, amongst other films, you know, Torch Song Trilogy and War Games and movies of this nature. And so I realized, well, what do you know? I just bumped into a movie star, and I didn't even know I had a confrontation with a movie star. I'm going to tell you, you can bump into movie stars, you can bump into famous people. While I lived in New York, I held the door, I don't know how many times it happened, that I held the door for a lady as she was leaving a place of business and somebody would say to me, do you know who that was? You just held the door for her. I said, no. He said, well, that was uh, Susan Sarandon. I held the door for Susan Sarandon on about three different occasions. Had no idea it was Susan Sarandon. I didn't know who, who she was, you know. One time I held the door for a young black lady who was kind of overdressed and had herself camouflaged pretty well. And I went into the place of business, and the man said, Do you know who that was? I said, No, I do not. He said, That was Queen Latifah. I said, Really? Oh, okay. So I held the door, and Latifah don't know me, and I don't know Latifah, and she could care less, I'm sure, about me. And as I'm telling this story, she's probably thinking, Really? That happened? Or, you know, I don't remember it. We can have confrontations and encounters with some of the biggest names and the most popular people in the world. And we leave that encounter with absolutely nothing. There was nothing accomplished. There was, there was, no, there was no great you know, experience related to that encounter. But I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. When you bump into Jesus, hallelujah, when you bump into Jesus, you're going to know you bumped into Jesus. Hallelujah. You're going to know you bumped into somebody because nobody that has an encounter with Jesus Christ ever walks away the same way. Amen. Hallelujah. There's always a change that occurs. And it's always a change for the better. This blind man came into the presence of Jesus and Jesus did something very unusual and very strange and he made a clay out of soil and spittle. And he put it on the man's eyes and then he said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I'm going to tell you, if that man had wanted to, he could have stopped at any number of locations long before he hit the pool of Siloam and washed that old spit and dirt out of his eyes. But that man told me to go to the pool of Siloam. I'm going to go to the pool of Siloam. I'll tell you something, children. When God tells you to do something, the smartest thing in the world you could ever do is do what He told you to do. Hallelujah. Right. You ain't going to get your miracle if you run into the first house and find a basin of water and a pitcher and a washcloth and wash out your eyes. You're not going to get your miracle that way. Naaman didn't get his miracle after speaking to the prophet of God by running down to the nearest river. No, he was told to go to what? The Jordan River. And he was told not to dip one time or two or three, but seven. How inconvenient. Even Naaman recognized how inconvenient it was. He said the Jordan River's muddy. It's dirty. It's filthy. My goodness. 
Don't we have better rivers where I come from? And the little Jewish servant said to him, If the prophet had asked you to do some great thing, if he'd have told you to go find the magic amulet somewhere, like they show in some of these movies, You'd have done that without a thought, but he asked you to do something simple. So, sir, name and sir, why don't you just do what he asked you to do? What can you lose? Tell you what you can lose. You can lose the leprosy you came with. I'm going to tell you something. If there's anything that I have a problem with when it comes to people in the church today, I'm, I, I, you know, sometimes I hate to say what the Holy Ghost puts in my heart to say, but I've got to say it. We got too many people in the church today that don't have a clue how to walk in the Spirit. They don't have a clue how to follow the leading of the Lord. And they wonder why they're living blessingless lives. They're wondering why God is not blessing, blessing them and opening up avenues for them and opening doors for them. Well, the reason simple. He's told you what to do and how to do it at times, and you keep opting to do it your own way. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you a little secret, my friend. God don't bless people who are doing their own thing. God blesses people who do what He's asked them to do. The Word of God said, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord. That doesn't mean you get in front of God and you kneel and you sit there and wait on Him. That's not what that means, not by a long shot. That actually means the same as we call an individual a waiter who works in a restaurant. And their job title is, uh, their job description I should say is, they wait tables or they wait on tables. They do the bidding of those who are seated at that table. They that wait upon the Lord. They that do the Lord's bidding shall renew their strength. They that do the Lord's bidding shall mount up with wings like his eagles. They that do the Lord's bidding shall run and not be weary and shall walk and not faint. Honey, if you want the blessing of God in your life, if you want that miracle you need, then you've got to learn to hear from God and obey God. Amen. I was 16 years old when God told me He wanted me to come to Texas. I never even visited Texas. I didn't know anything about Texas. The only person in the universe I knew in Texas was my great aunt and uncle and their uh, kids, their three kids, my cousins, all of which were older than me. Two of which were married and out of the house. I didn't know anything about Texas. My aunt had a reputation of being extremely strict. Every time she'd come up to New England to visit, uh, every summer she'd come up for a couple of months so she could be in a cooler environment because Texas, of course, gets hot. And my aunt had a reputation for being a very strict person and honestly kind of a bulldog. She, she was not, you know, looked at by any means as being warm and cuddly, not by a long shot. And I said, Lord, why do you want me to go to Texas? He said, I'm going to train you for your ministry. I'm going to prepare you for your ministry. I said, well... If that's what you want me to do, that's what you want me to do. I went to my mother. I was 16 years old, folks. Barely 16. Just turned 16. I went to my mother. I said, God spoke to me. I'm to go to Texas. My mother, my dad, they tried to convince me not to go, that I was, you know, just being a petulant child, and everybody thought I was just, you know, in myself, and that this was just something I wanted to do in order to escape the environment that I grew up in. And, you know, that sounded great, but I promise you, I was, I was wanting to get out of the environment I grew up in. But I was looking to when I was 18 to get out of the environment I was looking. I honestly can tell you I never had a thought in the world about leaving home of my own accord at 16 years old. 
Well, when the Lord spoke to me, I said, all right, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but I'm going to tell you something. God opened up blessing in my life. God opened up avenues in my life that to this day I benefit from every single day. He taught me things. He showed me things. He allowed me to experience things. He allowed my faith to grow. He allowed my experience with Him, my walk with Him, my relationship with Him to prosper and flower like it had never flowered before. And I'd have missed out on every bit of it if I'd have been fearful and unbelieving and kept my seat in my parents' house. This preacher, I don't have patience and I don't have time for people who don't know how to walk in the Spirit. And some people think I'm rude. And That old preacher, he's just stubborn and he's just hard-headed and old-fashioned. Yeah, and you know what? I wear that title, old-fashioned, very proudly. Honey, you can call me old-fashioned Pentecostal till the cows come home. I'm going to tell you, there ain't a better way in the world to be than old-fashioned Pentecostal. There ain't a better way in the world to be than somebody who knows how to get out and pray till the Holy Ghost comes down from heaven and until you get in the Spirit and you begin to worship God and sing and pray in the Holy Ghost till hours have passed don't even recognize that 10 or 15 minutes has gone by. There's a better way to be than somebody who knows how to get in the spirit when you're worshiping God and to forget all about everybody around you. And to recognize we all come into the house of God with one common purpose and that is to bring glory and honor to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if my bringing glory to God involves me doing a dance, then honey, I'm going to do a dance. If my bringing glory to God involves me shouting at the top of my lungs, then I'm going to shout. I could care less about what you're doing or how you're doing it. That's not why I'm here. That's not why any of us should be here. I wear the title of Old Fashioned Pentecostal proudly. God tells me to do something, you ask Tommy. Tommy and I have been together nearly 17 years now. And you ask him how many times. I'll look at him and say, the Lord laid on my heart to do something. And I know before I ever tell him that he's going to give me that funny look like this, it better be God or else. <laughs> <laughs> right, Booby? Yep. You don't know how many times the Holy Ghost will speak to my heart. I've had God, when I had uh, money in my pocket that, that I didn't expect to have, the money that just happened to come my way. One time I had a couple hundred dollars just happened to come my way that I wasn't expecting. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, This Sunday I want you to give that money $20 apiece to everybody that comes to church. I said, what, Lord? He said, I want you to give $20 to each person who comes to each service. And we were having services at that time, one in, in uh, the Fort Worth area and one over here in uh, Garland. And so I did I not, Tommy, give $20 to every person who was in every service. Yep. Give $20 each. Give all my money away. The Holy Ghost tells me to do it. By God, I'm going to do it. Because I'm going to tell you a little secret I learned a long time ago. That God don't ever ask you to do something as strange and as unusual and as peculiar as it may seem. God will never ask you to do something except that He has a higher purpose. I've said it before. God's spoken to people to come to Dallas to be part of this church. And... One after another after another, God has spoken to dozens of people to do this, and every single one of them, except for one, who actually came and spent a month or so at my house rent-free, he and his dog, I let him live in my house, 
And the minute he got his own apartment, he told me our church was a joke. We didn't have enough people, blah, 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 blah. And he quit coming. And Am I telling the truth? Every other one will be, not a one of them showed up, did they? Nope. And what they don't realize is, God had a purpose and a plan for asking them to come, and boy, did they miss out. But see, we live in a time when people think that they're smarter than God is, that they know better than God knows. If the Holy Ghost speaks to them to do something, they're going to do what they want to do. They're going to do what they feel comfortable doing. They're going to do what they prefer to do and ignore the counsel of God. I want to tell you something, sweetie. You wonder why you're not being blessed. You wonder why you look at other people and you say, how come the Lord's blessing them with a nice house? How come the Lord's blessing them with a nice car? How come the Lord is blessing them with a good job? How come the Lord is blessing them with a healthy uh, income? How come the Lord is blessing them with healings in their body? How come the Lord is blessing them by causing them to prosper in spite of illness and disease? And you wonder how come God is pouring out blessing on others and you're sitting there experiencing all kinds of negative things. I can tell you the answer. Because God put clay on your eyes and told you to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And you chose the nearest Exxon. Mm -hmm. You chose the nearest Texaco. Now, I'm going to get to the point of my message today. I can only tell you this. I'm going to get to that in a second. I just have to point something out to you because it's really exciting. You'll notice that the Lord instructed this blind man to go to the pool of Siloam. And the term Siloam, we are told in this passage. Now, I'm going to tell you, the writer would not have written the meaning of the term Siloam if it didn't have some significance. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, parentheses, which is by interpretation sent. <laughs> and... Enclosure, quotation mark, whatever you want to call it. Parentheses. I'm going to get it right. Which is by interpretation sent. Can I tell you a little secret? Because some of y'all looking at me like, okay, that doesn't mean nothing to me. Well, of course it doesn't. Because, see, I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to help you understand some things. That's my job. Do you know what the word Apostle means it means one who is sent. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I'm going to get Pentecostal in a minute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're blind today and you want to see, God has the ability to recreate your eyes. He made the first set. Hallelujah. And he's able to make a new set. That's what Jesus symbolized in making the clay out of, of uh, spittle and out of, uh, of earth. That was symbolic of recreation or making new eyes. That's why he anointed his eyes with that clay. He made man out of the dirt of the ground, didn't he? Out of the dust of the earth. Now he's doing something again. He's making this man new eyes so he can have sight. But if he's going to have the sight he needs to have, he needs to go to a specific pool. Not just any pool. He needs to go to the pool, which by interpretation means sent. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you want to be saved, if you want to be healed, if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, if you want to know the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God, that is able to deliver your soul and to save your body, you need to go to that which is sent. Hallelujah. There is no authority beyond the foundation of the church, which is the apostles and prophets. Isn't that what the Word of God says? And apostles means one who is sent. 
So the Lord said, go and wash in the pool of apostles. Hallelujah. <laughs> go and wash, if I might say it this way, in the apostolic pool. Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, there's always meaning. God doesn't include details in His Word that hold no meaning. So a great controversy arose out of this man's healing. You would have thought people would be jubilant. You would have thought people would have been rejoicing in the street, shouting and dancing and celebrating new sight for a man born blind. But no, that was not the reaction of the religious. No, the religious had all kinds of theology to apply. They had all kinds of theology they had to run past this man. Well, we know that man's a sinner, so we don't understand how he could have done that. How many people have written me from the mainstream Pentecostal church and said, how in the world can you talk in tongues? How in the world can you have tongues and interpretation and prophecy in your church? How in the world can you have a move of God in your church and be who you are? I can only tell you this. The proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. The disciples that came with Peter to the house of Cornelius and were present when the Holy Ghost fell on this assembled group of Romans, Gentiles, as the Holy Ghost had fallen on them at the beginning in the second chapter of the book of Acts, the word of God said they were astounded. They said, what is this? How, how is this possible that the Holy Ghost has fallen upon the house of Cornelius as he did on us at the beginning? How is it possible that God now is filling a bunch of Romans, a bunch of Gentiles, a bunch of what we've always viewed as unclean and filthy, sinful people. How is it possible that now God is filling them with the Holy Ghost? And they were astounded. Well, i got news for you. All your theology in the world fails in the face of God's sovereign action. Am I telling the truth? Amen. You can have all the... Well, bless God, the Gentiles aren't included in God's provision for a Messiah. We study the Word of God. We believe the Messiah is sent to Israel, for Israel, and that's as far as His work will go. And I'm sure that most of the Jewish people, most of Jewish theologians held this view concerning Messiah. And all of a sudden, God's pouring the Holy Ghost out on a bunch of Gentiles. What's going on here? I don't understand this. The same mindset that they came to this blind man with. What's going on here? I don't understand. What happened? How are you suddenly able to see when you've spent your entire life blind? And boy, I mean they're questioning Oh, they ask him his opinion on any number of issues. Well, what do you think about this man? Hello now. We're not sure we believe you. We need to get your parents. We, we, we need to get some proof that you really were born blind. And they bring the man's parents in. And the parents talk to them. And then the parents said, well, we can tell you he indeed was born blind. He indeed has been blind from birth. But you know what? He's a grown man. If you've got any questions, why don't you just direct them to him? Well, they'd already talked to him. They'd already run their theology past him. They'd already run their doctrine and their dogma against him. They bring him back in and they begin once again to grill him. Verse 22, these words spake his parents, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already. See, the Jews already had a viewpoint on the subject. Anybody who confessed Jesus was the Christ was going to be kicked out of the synagogue. Well, I've got news for you. 
you've got to understand that the Jewish people are not only a nationality, but they're also a religion. And their religion is directly tied to their nationality, okay? And being a part of the synagogue was an essential, important part of not only uh, the religious life, but even the social life of the Jewish people. So nobody wanted to be thrown out of the synagogue. Everybody wanted to be able to participate in the synagogue. So these people were afraid to speak their mind. They were afraid to say what they really thought. Because the Jews already had their minds made up. I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. You try to convince some religious folk in America today that you can be LGBT and Christian and all you're doing is wasting your breath and God's time. Right. Don't even waste your time. Don't even waste your effort. Don't even try to share the word of God with them. Don't even try to tell them what you know because it is a waste of effort. That's right. One thing that annoys me is people constantly write me and they're frustrated and they're angry and they're uptight because all I've been trying to tell my mother, I've been trying to tell my family member, I've been trying to tell this one and that one what I know about how someone can be LGBT and be a, be a born again child of God. And they just won't receive it. They just won't hear. No, because like the Jews, they already had their mind made up. So why are you wasting your breath on somebody who's already got their mind made up? Now listen, verse 23. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Oh, I'm going to tell you, religious people always know so much. When they say, I know this to be true, that means this is established fact. Homosexuality is a sin. Gay people are going to hell. Blah, 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 blah. I know this. Honey, you don't know nothing. You don't know a thing in the world. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know. I paraphrase that today. I can only tell you this. Whereas I was blind, now I see. Hallelujah. Oh, when somebody comes to you and says, You can't be a Christian. And be who you are. All you have to do. Don't bother trying to debate with them. Don't bother trying to have a Bible study with them. Don't bother trying to show them something in the Word of God. Look them in the eye and say, All I can tell you is this. Since I've given my life to the Lord, I've been walking in blessing. Since I've given my life to the Lord, I've had peace that passeth all understanding. Since I've given my life to the Lord, I've had joy unspeakable and full of glory. Since I've given my life to the Lord, He's redeemed my life from destruction. He's healed my body. He's delivered my mind. He's taken things out of my life that held me back and kept me captive and prevented me from achieving great things. Amen. As we sing today, He set me free. Oh, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see. Oh, glory to God. He set me free. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of the Lord. The Word of God tells us in 1 Timothy, I'm trying to hurry so I don't go over time today. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 and 21, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, 
falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Hallelujah. Keep what is entrusted to you and avoid profane and vain babblings. Hello now. I'm going to tell you, God hadn't called you to argue with folks. God hadn't called you to debate with folks. You are under no obligation to prove anything to anybody at any time. 2 Timothy 2 verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Titus 3, 8 and 9. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good, and profitable unto men. Now listen. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and vain. I've read to you now three Passages from the writings of the Apostle Paul that tell us to abstain from and to avoid arguments and to abstain from and to avoid. Uh, there's no sense getting into these discussions with people who aren't interested. They've already got their mind made up. They already know what they're going to believe because their religion has defined it for them. And the Word of God means nothing to religious folks. I'm going to tell you, oh, they may claim their religion is based on the Word of God. I remember growing up in a fundamentalist Christian denomination, and I was taught since I was a kid that the Word of God is true and every man is a liar. And yet, when I later in life came to understand some things different than that denomination teaches, uh, all of a sudden I was wrong that they were right. Why were they right? Because the Bible said what they said. No, because they said what they said. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Don't you let people condemn you. Don't you let people talk you out of your victory. Don't you let people discourage you, telling you all kinds of dogma and doctrine and ideologies that their religion has sold them. It doesn't matter what they feel, what they think, what they believe. What matters is what you understand and what you believe because God ain't going to hold you to a standard that's established by them. He's going to hold you to a standard that is established by Him. Mm. The Word of God reads today in 1 Peter. The Apostle Peter is writing chapter 3 verses 15 through 17. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And the word conversation here literally means behavior, your good behavior in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. How many people let somebody come to them and condemn them and criticize them and drive them up the wall and Tommy they give up their walk with God they quit trying to live for the Lord they go out in the world and they're doing drugs and they're drinking and they're partying and they're slutting it up and they're sleeping around and they're doing everything they know as a child of God it'd be better for them that they not do and then the people who cause them to backslide the people who push them out of the church sit there and say see see I told you 
I'm going to tell you something. All the people who want to talk bad about me because I am who I am, let them talk bad because my life says different than what they accuse. Hello Amen. now. Amen. Let them say all they want to say. Let them make all the accusations they want to make because anybody who examines my life can see that I'm doing everything in my power to live for Jesus. I'm doing everything in my power to live a testimony. I'm doing everything in my power to lead others to the cross. I'm doing everything in my power to be a good and faithful servant so that one day I might hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, Peter said, Be ready to give an answer of the hope. He did not say you had to give an explanation. See, he didn't say you have to give scripture and verse. No, I've got an answer for anybody that comes to me and says, well, how in the world do you think you can be a Christian and be LGBT? I've got an answer. This is my answer. I can only tell you this. I can only tell you this. Since I came back to the Lord because I was out of church for a few years, oh, I'm going to tell you, my life has changed. Oh, that, like the old song said, there's a great change since I'm reborn. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. Things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. There's been a great change since I'm reborn. Hallelujah. And those changes are not because... I have stopped saying and doing and going places because I'm afraid of hell. No, those changes have occurred in my life because the closer I get to Jesus, the less I want to say that. The closer I get to Jesus, the less I want to go there. The closer I get to Jesus, the less I want to do that. Hello now. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you can think what you want to think. I've got an answer. I can only tell you this, in 2000, I lay in the hospital bed. Doctor said within 24 hours I'd be dead. They told my family that for a full month. Here I am now, 19 years later going on. This summer will mark 19 years. I got out of the hospital October, I believe it was the 6th of 2000. Uh, 2000. So I'm almost 19 years out of the hospital. God gave me a miracle. I was preaching in and pastoring a small LGBT affirming church back in 2000. I started my affirming ministry back in 1993. I've been at it already for several years. A bunch of LGBT Christian folk and Phoenix, Arizona prayed over a prayer cloth and sent it to me, Federal Express, and God gave me a miracle. The day after I received it, I suddenly began to recover, and the doctors were able to remove the life support, and I was able to support my own breathing. This is after one attempt to remove the life support, only to, for them to have to reintubate me because I was drowning, and they, I could not support my own breathing. See, I can only tell you this. God has healed me. He's delivered me when I should have been dead. Hallelujah. Oh, Tommy, he has blessed us, hasn't he? He's blessed us mightily. God has blessed us. And the old song said, he keeps on blessing me. He keeps right on blessing me. Unworthy as I am, he's blessing me again. All I can ever be is his for eternity. Because... He keeps on blessing me. I want to tell you something. I've got an answer. It's not going to be a Bible study because you don't want to know what the Bible said. I've got an answer. It's not going to be scripture and verse because you're going to have an alternate explanation for what that scripture and verse means. My answer is simply this. The proof is in the pudding. I can only tell you this since I have come into relationship with Jesus Christ. My life has been better and brighter and more blessed than it has ever been in my entire life. Whereas I once was blind, hallelujah, now I see. You can have all the thoughts you want to, 
about my situation. You can have all the ideas and all the theologies and all the teachings you want to about my relationship with God and my ability to live for Him and to serve Him and to be rewarded by Him. You can have all the opinions in the world, but honey, I can only tell you this, it works for me. Amen. I have peace. I have joy. I feel the love of God. I have all the things Jesus promised those who would believe and obey this gospel. And so far as I'm concerned, that's enough. That's enough for me. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Trying to